Okay, do we get a, well, let me get started. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here today. Uh, and uh, we have had uh, the series, speaker series, uh, renamed speaker series now for a couple of years. We have had uh, some great speakers. Uh, and we started this year, in fact, with a great lady, uh, Lynn Fruth, who owns one of the largest uh, independent pharmacy chains in the state and was uh, an example of a turnaround. <laughs> Uh, and today we're very, very, very thankful to have uh, John Ellison uh, with us, and we're going to talk a little bit more about him. Uh, he's got a great life story and a successful business career. Uh, on April, I think, the 25th, we're, we'll have uh, Marty Becker, one of our graduates, uh, who is a very successful businessman on his own right. He just sold his gigantic reinsurance company based in, uh, in Bermuda, in operations in Charleston throughout the United States. Uh, and then the second half of the year, uh, in the fall, we're going to have some very outstanding uh, uh, individuals to come and speak. The whole idea of bringing these uh, speakers is to present to you role models, individuals who have gone through academia, uh, become you know, successful business people uh, in industry, in government. And you know, we, at times, in this day and age, we lack for role models. And so I think it's a uh, responsibility of the college to provide those role models. And so uh, I think we're very happy to have today someone who's really not only been a great successful story in business. And the last time I met him, he was a professor, in fact, at Wake Forest. <laughs> uh, I visited with him. And now he is uh, you know, the president of the Cato Institute, uh, which is a major think tank in Washington, D.C. And he was sharing with me just briefly before uh, in comparing BB&T and uh, Wake Forest and, uh, and the think tank, and, uh, and the difference on how to manage uh, and so on and so forth. But before I do go in, into more depth uh, in his uh, bio, uh, we have made available to uh, some of the students, not, not for all the students because we have more students than we anticipated, uh, books that <coughs> were just published, in fact, by John. It's a great book. You should read it. <coughs> And um, at the end of the exercise, we'd like to have uh, John, he's going to be available for some autographs. So if you want to have your uh, book autographed, uh, John uh, offered himself to do that. Before we get started and introduce him officially, I also want to welcome uh, the BBNT team uh, from uh, our regional office here, which is the, I think you run half of the, uh, Mr. Cox, uh, half of the stage. Uh, so we have several people. So could we get the BBNT? personnel to stand up and so we can uh, welcome them. Very good. Okay. So first of all, we want to thank John because he braced the weather, went through the various mountains between Washington DC and here and made it, made it on time and uh, promptly. So thank you very much, John. John is the president and CEO of the Cato Institute. Prior to that, uh, John was chairman and CEO of BB&T Corporation, the 10th largest financial service holding company headquartered in the United States. During his tenure as CEO from 1989 to 2008, BB&T grew from $4.5 billion to $152 billion in assets. And I can tell you, to go from $5 billion or approximately to or well, today probably 180 billion, it's no, no easy task. So great, great accomplished, John. He was recognized by the Harvest Business Review as one of the top 100 most successful CEOs in the world over the last decade. Ellison has received, uh, received the Corning Award for Distinguished Leadership, uh, being inducted into the North Carolina Business Hall of Fame, and received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Banker. He's a former distinguished professor of practice at Wake Forest University School of Business and serves on the Board of Visitors at the Business School at Wake Forest, Duke, and UNC uh, Chapel Hill. He's also a, a Phi Beta Cap, uh, Kappa graduate of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. He received his master's degree in management from Duke, and he's also a graduate of the Stonier Graduate School of Banking, which I think is at Rutgers, as I understand it. So let's have a very welcome, uh, WVU Mountaineer, welcome to John. John. Good 
Good morning, and uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be back in West Virginia. Uh, BBT does have the largest market share in West Virginia, and I've had the pleasure of touring the state many times and meeting a lot of people. It's a great state with great people. Uh, my purpose this morning is to talk about the uh, financial crisis and uh, both its causes and its long-term consequences. I have to admit, I wish I, I had something more fun to talk about, but uh, the reality is the financial crisis is really the defining economic event in the last 80 years. It's had a profound impact on government policy and in many ways, I think, unfortunately, will have a profound impact on the quality of your lives. And also, most of what you've heard in the press is misleading. Most people that talk about the financial crisis really don't know what happened. I happen to be the longest serving CEO of any major financial institution in the U.S. and got to see the events develop from the inside. Um, I want to share with you five basic themes. First, government policy is the primary cause of the financial crisis. We don't live in a free market in the United States. We live in what's called a mixed economy. Mixture varies a lot by industry. Technology is the least regulated industry in the U.S. and it's the one that's done the best. Financial services is the most regulated industry in the world, and our problems have originated in the financial services industry. It's not surprising that the most regulated industry is where we have our problems. Secondly, government policy created a massive misinvestment, what's called a bubble. <laughs> that bubble got focused in the residential real estate market. When the bubble burst, it destroyed millions of jobs and trillions of dollars of wealth. Uh, thirdly, a number of large financial institutions, so-called Wall Street, made very serious mistakes. If I had been in charge, I would have let those institutions fail. It would have been a good market clearing process. However, those mistakes were secondary and were highly incented by uh, government policy. Fourthly, and most unfortunately, almost everything we've done since the financial crisis started, which has now been almost five years, uh, even things that will help in the short term will reduce your standard of living in the long term. And finally, and maybe most significantly, the real cause of financial crisis is philosophical and the real cure is philosophical, and I'm going to focus on those philosophical considerations. First, what happened? Um, we invested at least $3 trillion, argumentatively up to $8 trillion too much in residential real estate. We built too many houses, too big of houses. We built houses in the wrong place. Um, we should have been investing in technology, manufacturing capacity, agriculture, education. We should have saved more and spent less. We should have borrowed a lot less from foreigners to finance that, uh, those expenditures. Overinvesting in residential real estate is particularly destructive because are we have enough. Overinvesting in residential real estate is particularly destructive because housing is consumption. Now, a lot of people don't think about uh, housing as consumption, but you consume a house just like you consume an automobile. And if you over consume, what you do is reduce your capacity to produce in the future. So instead of uh, saving our seed corn for next year's crop as an agricultural example, we ate our seed corn and that reduces our capacity to produce in the future. In addition, in the process of over investing in housing, we taught many people how to do the wrong thing. We taught them how to be construction workers or real estate brokers or mortgage bankers. And those people are having to learn new jobs. And it takes a while to do that. And some people can't do that. And that's caused the, the, a lot of the, the high unemployment and the transition costs. And then when manufacturing wages and construction wages are competitive. If you arbitrarily, artificially raise uh, man, uh, construction wages, you're going to drive up manufacturing wages. And what that did was drive a lot of manufacturing jobs overseas to places like India and China. And initially, the workers in those countries didn't know how to do those jobs very well, but now they do. And we're having a very difficult time getting those jobs back. So we sent it, incented a massive overconsumption. It happened to be focused in housing. Well, how do we make a mistake of that magnitude? Um, markets are constantly learning. They're constantly correcting. They're constantly making mistakes. But markets never make mistakes of this, this magnitude. It takes government policy to incent some kind of error of this, this size. And the three primary culprits were errors made by the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and then government housing policy, and specifically Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the giant government-sponsored enterprises. Let's talk a little bit about each one of these problems. Let's talk first about the Federal Reserve. Uh, something that 
you, as you study economics, you learn, but you don't really oftentimes think about what it means. In 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created, the monetary system in the United States was nationalized. There is no private monetary system. The government owns a monetary system. If there are problems in the monetary system, they are by definition government policy problems. Uh, you can probably use an analogy with interstate highways. The government owns the interstate highways. If interstate highway bridges were falling down, you'd say, wow, that's the government's problem. They own the highways. The, the government owns a monetary system in, in the U.S. They, they, uh, through the Federal Reserve. Therefore, if you're having trouble in the monetary system, they have to be government uh, policy problems. The Federal Reserve was created in theory to reduce volatility in the economy. Um, however, in practice, what the Federal Reserve does is increase volatility in the long term, even though it reduces it in the short term. In a free market, markets are constantly correcting. Uh, businesses are being created, but old businesses are failing. And the failure process is as important as the creation process because resources have to be reallocated to more productive uses. If you keep making buggy whips when you ought to be making automobiles, you're going to reduce the productivity of the economic system. So the failures are necessary. If the Federal Reserve keeps the failures from happening, uh, then it just pushes problems into the future. It'd be analogous to not disciplining a 13-year-old, you're going to be pretty unhappy when they get to be 16 years old. Uh, in addition, the Federal Reserve creates this massive temptation on politicians. When the Federal Reserve was created, the United States basically had no debt. And now we have a tremendous amount of debt. And if you're a politician, it's nice to spend money and give away gi gimmies to get it voted for, and you don't want to tax people, so that's not very popular. So you get to run massive deficits that are effectively financed by the Federal Reserve. So since the Federal Reserve was created, government debt in the United States has gone up exponentially. Um, in addition, there were some very specific errors made by the Federal Reserve that led to the most recent crisis. In the early 2000s, Alan Greenspan, who had been the longtime leader of the Federal Reserve, was getting ready to retire. And he kind of wanted to go out a hero. We were getting ready to have a, we were having a minor correction, and he didn't want that to happen. So he started effectively printing money by creating what's called negative real interest rates. That meant you could borrow it less than the inflation rate. So you could borrow it 2% and house prices were going up 5 or 6%. Created huge temptation for people to borrow. Right at the end of his career, he realized, wow, I've made a mistake. And he and his, his successor, Vernacki, raised interest rates very rapidly. In fact, they raised interest rates 400% in two years. Um, you can imagine if your tuition went up 400% in two years, that would be pretty dramatic. Well, for banks, interest expense is our tuition, it's our cost of funds, so our, our expenses went up that fast. And, and then Bernanke did something that's really uh, unusual. He created what's called an inverted yield curve. That's where short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. Markets never invert yield curves. But if you think about it, if you're going to invest long, you're going to want a higher return because it's riskier and less liquid. And if short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, that's not a natural market phenomenon. That's created by the Federal Reserve. And this was the longest inverted yield curve uh, in, in U.S. history. Why did that happen uh, was because of policies of the Federal Reserve. What was the consequence? Banks make money by borrowing short and lending long. So banks had negative margin. We were buying watermelons for $10 and selling them for $8. Not much fun. Now, banking's a funny business. You can get higher returns by taking more risk. So during, the very, during this inverted yield curve, lots of banks started taking much more risk because at the same time, the Federal Reserve was, was predicting good times forever. So a lot of the bad loans were made very at the end of the cycle uh, under a, a very negative margin for banks where the Federal Reserve said good times forever, take more risk. In a certain basic sense, we couldn't have had a bubble if the Federal Reserve hadn't provided the money. It's not mathematically possible. Another culprit was the FDIC insurance, which sounds good. That's where your bank deposits are insured by the government. Sounds like a good thing. Um, however, it, it destroys market discipline because a typical depositor doesn't care how strong their bank is. They put money in based on this government guarantee. I'll give you an example of that. In the Atlanta market where bb and operates, a lot of community banks fail. We, we took over one of those banks, and it was a typical story where 10 guys or so, 10 or 12 guys that were, had been in the motel business, decided to start a bank. 
They raise a little capital and they raise that, uh, they, they leverage that capital dramatically by buying certificates to deposit at very high interest rates. Consumers didn't care about how strong the bank was because they had the government deposit insurance. The bank then lent that money to these guys' cronies in the motel business and went broke and, and the FDIC lost 50 cents on the dollar. On a bigger plane, some large financial institutions you probably heard about, IndyMac, Washington Mutual, Countrywide, uh, Golden West, all finance high-risk lending businesses using government deposit insurance. They couldn't possibly have raised the capital in the private market without government deposit insurance. The proximate cause of the uh, uh, recent financial crisis was government housing policy. And this goes back a long time where the government's tried to incent home ownership under the theory that home ownership is a good thing. Well, home ownership's a good thing, but actually encouraging people to buy houses they can't afford is not a good thing. And another interesting thing is having a home per se doesn't change human behavior. It's a set of characteristics, the savings and self-discipline that allow you to have a home that's a good thing. So many people bought homes they couldn't afford and we're getting the major negative consequences of that. The beginning of this cycle uh, was probably back in the 1970s, something called the Community Reinvestment Act that encouraged banks to get into the so-called affordable housing, i.e. subprime lending business. But the big event happened in uh, September of 1999 when Bill Clinton, who was President of the United States, announced that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae had to have at least half their loan portfolio in affordable housing, i.e. subprime loans. And I'm going to tell you about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in just a minute. But Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae um, uh, are, are big players in the, in the housing market. And when, when that announcement was made, a number of economists, including liberal economists, said, wow, that's risky. In fact, it was an article in the New York Times. Because if you look at the legitimate affordable housing, i.e. subprime lending market in the United States, it's not that big. And if Freddie and Fannie reach that goal, they're going to have to take enormous risk and <laughs> do really high risky loans. And that could get them in financial trouble. And they're so big, they could take out the US financial system. It could happen in 10 years. And nine years later, it happened. When Freddie and Fannie Mae failed, they owed $5 trillion. And they had $2 trillion in subprime mortgages. They absolutely dominated the subprime business. If you go out and get a home mortgage today, even if you go to a bank or you go to a mortgage broker, wherever you go, there's, there's a 90-something percent probability that your home mortgage will be sold to either Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or FHA, which is a sister organization. So even though most people don't really know what they are, they dominate the home finance business in the U.S. And the reason they've been able to dominate the business is the government guarantees their debts. And if the government guarantees your debts, that gives you a huge competitive advantage. Before they failed, they had a they had a thousand dollars in debt for every dollar in equity. That would be like you having a net worth of ten thousand dollars and owing ten million dollars. Now, the only way you get away with that is the government guarantees your debt. Uh, so the government put huge pressure on Freddie and Fannie to do these affordable housing loans. They dominated the market. They had such a big market share, they sucked everybody down. And the, and the harder they tried to reach their goals, the more lower the standards had to be. Um, politics played a huge role with Freddie and Fannie. I was personally on a committee of what's called the Financial Services Roundtable, which is the largest banks in the U.S., trying to do something about Freddie and Fannie. We were running the numbers. It was mathematically certain they were going broke. Anybody in here would have said, wow, these guys are going broke. Uh, we met with congressmen, people like uh, Chris Dodd and Barney Frank, uh, very interesting people. Anyway, uh, we showed them the numbers, and they absolutely refused to see them. And why is that? They had a religious belief in affordable housing. They weren't interested in a rational argument. And then secondly, Freddie and Fannie were huge political contributors. They were big contributors to the Republican Party, and they were the single biggest contributors to the Democratic Party. So Congress put pressure on Freddie and Fannie for these affordable housing loans, and that's where this massive misinvestment did. There are lots of bells and whistles, and I'll talk about one bell and whistle in just a minute. But fundamentally, the reason we had a financial crisis, the Federal Reserve printed too much money trying to avoid a natural correction that you need in free markets. It led to a bubble. The bubble got focused in the, in the housing market because of Freddie and Fannie and the affordable housing policy of the U.S. government. Talk about one of the bells and uh, whistles, um, something called pick a payment mortgages. Um, this was a product actually targeted at people like you. This was not a low-income product. 
It was targeted at young people who were coming out or getting a job, and the expectation was that their, their, their pay would go up over time. And the way the product worked is you get a mortgage, and your interest is $1,000 a month, but you only have to pay $500 a month. So each month you owe more on your house. At the end of five years, you owe more than you did when you bought the house. Now the theory was that the house prices would appreciate because house prices had been going up for a long period of time. This product was very popular in places like Southern California and, and Southern Florida and Metro DC. Uh, and, and you buy as big a house as you can, leverage it, and then refinance after five years. Uh, unfortunately, of course, when house prices started going down, a lot of young people ended up being broke because of this product. The big player, by the way, in the, uh, uh, the pick a payment mortgage business was a company called Golden West, and Golden West finances high risk loan portfolio using FDIC insurance. Without FDIC insurance, they could not have been uh, able to finance this, this, this uh, pick a payment mortgage product. Of course, interestingly, the reason that Golden West invented the pick a payment mortgage is they couldn't compete with the government in the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae who dominated the, the regular home mortgage business. So, a, so Golden West was forced out of traditional mortgage lending, innovated with a very destructive product, used government deposit insurance to set up a mess. Um, what should we be doing from an economic perspective? Our studies, I, I work for the K2 Institute, and we're a free market think tank, and our studies show overwhelmingly, this is throughout the, the history and throughout the world, the single biggest factor that drives economic growth is having relatively small government as a percentage of GDP. When government expenditures get over a certain level of, of gross uh, domestic product, they reduce the, the growth rate in the economy. Our government expenditures as a percentage of our uh, uh, economy have risen radically in recent years, really starting with George Bush and then being amplified by the current administration, and it will and is reducing the growth rate in the U.S. economy and your standard of living. Cutting government expenditures will increase the quality of life in the United States long term. That's a mathematical fact based on lots, lots of evidence. Um, we, need, we need less regulation, not more. Markets didn't fail to cause a gun, uh, this crisis. Banks were not deregulated. There was a massive increase in regulation of the banking industry during the Bush administration. The Patriot Act, the, the uh, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, the uh, Privacy Act were all enacted during the Bush administration. And while there was plenty of greed on Wall Street uh, in my 40-year career, there was no evidence of any more greed than usual. The financial crisis was not caused by deregulation and greed on Wall Street. Uh, it was caused by systematic government policies, and the regulations are, are reducing the ability of us to innovate and, and, and be created. We need low and neutral tax rates. We need sound money. That's obviously an issue. We need to think about privatizing things that we have massive deficits in, like Social Security, Medicare, uh, Freddie and Fannie. Uh, and we really need to let markets correct. One of the reasons that it's taken so long for our economy to recover, we've done everything we could to keep the housing market from correcting. What happens in economic cycles, people made bad investments, and you have to clear the marketplace. And if you keep businesses or uh, people in homes that they can't afford the home, you just you make the pain longer, you make the correction take place. Uh, over a longer period of time. As interesting as the economic factors are, though, the real cause of the financial crisis and the real cure is philosophical. The real cause is a combination of altruism and pragmatism. Now, altruism is not benevolence. Benevolence is a really good thing. What altruism is, is otherism. It says that everybody else is more important than you. And it's interpreted by status. It says that the collective is important but the individual doesn't matter. Everybody has a right to a nice house, provided by who? Everybody has a right to free medical care, provided by who? You know, my right to free medical care is my, is my right to force a doctor to provide me with that medical care or to force somebody else to pay that doctor. That is exactly the opposite of the American concept of rights. In the American concept of rights, you have the right to what you produce, what you create. You don't have the right to what somebody else produced, what somebody else created. Now, in business, we like to pretend to be altruistic. We run altruistic ads. We talk altruistically. But there are no altruistic businesses in a globally competitive market. They will go out of business fast. So the backup strategy in business is pragmatism. In fact, we teach a lot of that in business schools. And what's the rule in pragmatism? Do what works. 
Here's the problem with doing what works. A lot of things work in the short term that are very destructive in the long term. Uh, affordable housing worked for years. Negative amortization mortgages worked for years and then created economic chaos. Um, there's also some other deeper problems with being a pragmatist. You can't be rational. Rationality demands long-term perspective. You also can't have integrity. Integrity is acting consistent with principles. That's why we have so many ethical deviations in business. If you combine altruism and pragmatism, you get something I call the free lunch mentality. And this is across the whole political spectrum where people realize we have some really serious problems with things like Social Security and Medicare, and nobody really wants to deal with them. Nobody wants to deal with them. And that free lunch mentality leads to a lack of personal responsibility. And a lack of personal responsibility is ultimately the death of democracies. In fact, I would argue the fundamental issue in our society is personal responsibility versus entitlement. Are you responsible for yourself or are you entitled to what somebody else produces? It's a very fundamental question. The Founding Fathers talked about the tyranny of the majority and they were talking about the abuse of individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, but they also recognized that when 51% of the people could vote a free lunch from 49%, pretty soon the party's over. Because 60% would like a free lunch from 40%, and 70% would like a free lunch from 30%, and finally the 30% quit. Just like the cause is philosophical, so is the cure. And the cure was expressed by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's moral right to their own life. Each individual's moral right to pursue their personal happiness. Each individual's moral right to the product of their labor. If you produce a lot, you get a lot, including the right to give it away to whoever you want to for whatever reason you want to. If you think about that moral prerogative, it demands personal responsibility because there is no free lunch. It also demands and rewards rationality. It demands and rewards self-discipline. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, let's talk about liberty for a minute. My observation is almost everybody is for liberty. It's a good thing, and it is a good thing intrinsically, but many people don't really realize how important liberty is to human well-being. Everything that's alive has a method of staying alive. A lion has claws to hunt with, a deer has speed to avoid the hunter, and we have the capacity to think. And our capacity to think is literally our only means of survival, success, and happiness. And no shortcuts or no free lunches. What's interesting is in order to think effectively, we have to be free. If someone forces you to act like 2 plus 2 is 5, you literally cannot think. You cannot think effectively. Government rules and regulations often force business people to act like 2 plus 2 is 5 and reduce productivity and reduce economic well-being. If you think about it, all human progress by definition is based on creativity, on innovation. So unless somebody does something better, which will be different, there can be no progress. Creativity is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot innovate, cannot be creative, cannot contribute to human progress. That's why entrepreneurs are so important to human well-being. That is why socialism and communism is doomed to failure, because it destroys innovation and it destroys creativity. Um, interesting observation. Looking at the long-term history of man, from whenever Homo sapiens evolved, 250,000 BC, until the late 1700s, life expectancy on the Earth was basically the same. It was about 18 years. Beginning in the late 1700s, there was a revolution and, and, and it began in Western civilization and now exponentially is improving the quality of life on the planet. What was the nature of that revolution? It was the invention of rule of law, the invention of individual rights, the invention of capitalism. It was an invention of a system that allowed people to think for themselves, to act for themselves as free people. And it had a profound impact on the quality of life because man's nature is that we have to think for ourselves. How about the pursuit of happiness? A lot of people don't really reflect on what that means. First, it was a revolutionary idea. Before Jefferson, before the thinkers of the Enlightenment, everybody existed for somebody else's good. Good to the king, good to the state, good to the church. Nobody existed for their own good. Jefferson said that each of us had the moral right to the pursuit of our personal happiness. 
We weren't guaranteed success in that pursuit, but we had, had that opportunity. That was a world-changing idea. Created the most successful society in history and the most benevolent. When people have the right to their own life, they're naturally nicer than others, than, to other people. In communist and so socialist societies, at the end of the day, everybody ends up hating each other because they're all slaves to each other. And I agree with Jefferson. Each of us has the moral right to the pursuit of our personal happiness. Um, if you think about that idea, however, it's a very selfish idea, isn't it, right? Pursuing your personal happiness. Let's reflect on that for a minute. Let's, let's define it as acting in one's rational, long-term self-interest. And it's important that we define it properly because we get this false alternative. And the false alternative is to take advantage of other people and self, or self-sacrifice, neither one of which makes sense. Uh, first, a lot of people think taking advantage of other people is selfish. Here's the irony. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish, it's self-destructive. First, you might fool Tom, Dick, and Harry, but they're going to tell Sue, Jane, and Fred, and nobody's going to trust you. You probably know people like that, and you certainly see that in business. And if you're not trusted, you're not going to be successful, and you're certainly not going to be happy. In addition, if you go try to manipulate other people's mind, letting go of the truth, you're going to do a lot more damage to you than you do to them. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish, it's self-destructive. How about self-sacrifice? That is the moral code of our society, right? We all want our self-sacrifice. I want to ask you to ask yourself what I would argue is the most profound question you can ask yourself. Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Of course you do. Of course you do. Why would you believe anything different than that? So taking advantage of other people and self-sacrifice, neither one make any sense. There is a moral code, however, that underlies free societies, that underlies free markets. I call it the trader principle. Life is really about getting better together. It's about creating win-win relationships. It's about finding ways that we can both benefit. In our business, in the banking business, we help our clients be economically successful. They make, let us make a profit doing it. We got better together. Life is about getting better together. In fact, there are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. Whenever you get greedy and you set up a win-lose, you see this in spousal relationships. Pretty soon your partner's going to get bitter and you're going to end up in a lose-lose relationship. Whenever you get self-sacrificial and you set up a lose-win, you're going to get bitter and you're going to end up in a lose-lose relationship. So in any important relationship in your life, you should ask, what's in it for me? That's a very fair question. But you should also ask, what's in it for them? Because if there's nothing in it for them, at the end of the day, there'll be nothing in it for you. And of course it's in your rational self-interest to help people you care about, because you care about them, right? Your family, your friends, the people you work with. In fact, uh, if you love your children, helping your children is not a sacrifice. In fact, love is the ultimate expression of selfishness. Now, most people don't think of it that way, but for this age group, I'll give you an example. You're getting ready to get married. It's obviously a big event in your life. Your future spouse comes up to you and says, Honey, I am so excited about marrying you. This is the biggest self-sacrifice I've ever made. Not exactly what you want to hear, is it? Um, I believe it is in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. The United Way is an umbrella charity organization that does a lot of good in the community. I wouldn't want to live in the kind of community that would exist if there weren't a United Way, and I wouldn't want my children to live in that kind of community. So it is in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. So here's the challenge. Here's what acting in your rational self-interest would require. First, that you hold the context. You say, wow, what kind of world would I like to live in, and what would I enjoy doing helping create that world. Doesn't have to be dramatic, but what would, what would be meaningful to me in help creating a better world? And that, what would that require? That you have a sense of purpose, that you take care of your body, you exercise, you eat properly, that you take care of your mind, you study, read, think, that you work hard to create healthy relationships with other human beings that share your values. What if everybody had a sense of purpose, took care of their minds, took care of their bodies, work hard to uh, create healthy uh, relationships with other people? Uh, what if everybody held the context? Being selfish is not taking advantage of other people and have this linear world, uh, world view, but asking what kind of world would I like to live in and what would I enjoy doing there? I would argue that 90% of the world's problems would go away if people would act in their rational self-interest. My observation is very few people act in their rational self-interest. Most people are self-destructive. I had a brother-in-law drank 24 beers a day, uh, got cirrhosis of the liver, drank 24 beers a day, and died. People say he was selfish. I say he was self-destructive. 
Bernie Madoff, the guy that stole, stole billions of dollars from his family and friends, stole from his best friends and family for 30 years. He said the best day in his life is when he got called. He was not selfish. He was self-destructive. Jefferson was right. We have the right and we should pursue our rational self-interest. We should pursue our personal happiness. And that idea underlies free and successful societies. Back to economics for just a, a minute because people ask me about this. We are, I think, in some kind of economic recovery. That's the good news. The bad news is we're stuck in low gear because of public policy uh, decisions that we're making. We should be having a much more dramatic recovery. The most likely scenario is either something like the, the Japanese or stagflation like we had in the 1970s. In either case, it's below average growth, above average unemployment may be better than today, and eventually higher, higher inflation. It's not a terrible time, but it's not a great time. What scares me and what should scare all of you is what happens in 15, 20 years down the road, and you really ought to be worried about this. We have a recipe for an economic disaster. If we continue with altruism, pragmatism, free lunch mentality, the unfunded actorial liability under Social Security, Medicare, the new Obamacare program, unfunded public pension plans is over $100 trillion. It is an absolutely stunning number. We're running $1 trillion annual operating deficits. We have dysfunctional foreign policy. We got a big problem with the retirement of the baby boomer generations and us old people want to keep being fed and we have a failed K through 12 education system by any kind of objective standards. We have a recipe for economic disaster if we don't change direction. This is not politics, this is mathematics and economic facts. Um, it reminds me very much of that story I told you about Freddie Mac where we were number, the, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, we were running the numbers and they went broke in, in, uh, uh, in 10 years. That's exactly what this looks like. Now here's the, here's the opportunity. We can change direction. However, we need to change direction soon. This problem goes exponential in about eight years because of the demographics of the baby boomer generation. And the sooner we act, the less the pain will be in the long term. Uh, the bad news, we have been identified with a form of cancer that is terminal if not treated. The good news is treatable. The unfortunate news is the, the treatment is chemotherapy and chemotherapy is not fun. So the question is not do we have the ability, the question is do we have the will. I'm on the relatively optimistic side, although you know, you can't argue we're headed directly headed in the right direction, and, and for two reasons. One reason is very practical. We know that free markets work. We know that limited government works. We've had experiments all over the globe and they've been tremendously successful. So we know what the solutions are. Less government, less interference in markets, more innovation, more creativity. And Americans are naturally creative people. So we, even though we're going in the wrong direction, we actually know what the right answers are, which is a good thing. The other thing is what I call the American sense of life. And I think it has to do with that idea of the pursuit of happiness. And I, I want to close with a thought around that. Um, people ask me um, how bb and did better than other large financial institutions. We did. We actually objectively did better than any large financial institution in the U.S. Through the, through the financial crisis. We had some great strategies and really great people, but mostly we had a better philosophy, uh, a better set of fundamental commitments. And the irony is the purpose of that philosophy in a really deep sense was to help our employees and our clients, the people we deal with, pursue their happiness, pursue their happiness. And so I want to talk about the pursuit of happiness in a little different sense. Um, <coughs> if you think about the pursuit of happiness, it's not about having a good time on Friday night. It, it's, uh, it's, when I talk about happiness, I'm talking about in the Aristotelian sense. It's, it's when you're 80 years old, you can look back and say, man, I'm glad I did that. Hard work, blood, sweat, and tears paid for happiness. That is actually the end of the game, right? Being happy. Sometimes business people get confused. They think money's the end of the game. Nothing wrong with money. Money's a good thing, but it's not an end. It can be a means to an end, but happiness is the end of the game. And the foundation for happiness is real self-esteem, real self-esteem. Share with you a couple thoughts about self-esteem. It's a complex subject. One, self-esteem is fundamentally self-confidence in your ability to live and be successful given the facts of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. Nobody can give you self-esteem. You cannot give anybody self-esteem. You cannot give your children self-esteem. Self-esteem has to be earned. Live your life with integrity. Raise your self-esteem. Second thought about self-esteem is uh, for everybody in this room, 
And the vast majority of people on this planet, the single biggest driver of your self-esteem is your work. And I use work in the broadest context, raising children, very hard, very productive work. Whatever you define your work to be, it will be the biggest driver of your self-esteem because you spend a disproportionate amount of time, effort, and energy at work. That's why work is important. Something I said many times to the employees of bb and You know, it's real important to bb and that you do your job well. However, it is far, far more important to you. Might fool me about how well you do your job. Might fool your boss about how well you do your job. But you'll never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill and level of knowledge, you can't do the impossible. But if you don't do your work the best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem. By the way, your work in this university is your schoolwork. If you don't do your schoolwork the best you can do it, <clears throat> given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, you will lower your self-esteem even if you get a good grade. Now here's the good news, the flip's also true. Do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, and you will raise your self-esteem, which is more important than whether you get a good grade or a promotion or more money, because it's about your character. And there's actually a really significant social implication of that. Um, take a, uh, a construction worker, a bricklayer, has a really tough, hard, grinding life. My granddad had that kind of life. He went to work at 13 year, years old selling newspapers to feed his family because his dad had drank him, his, his father had drank himself to death. Tough, grinding life. But that bricklayer has a successful life in this context. He and his wife successfully raise their children. Maybe his granddaughter becomes CEO of a publicly traded company, maybe not. He has a hard, grinding life, but he gets something really precious from that work. He gets to be proud of himself. He gets self-esteem. Take that same bricklayer and give him welfare. He may be better off financially, but he loses something very precious. He loses his pride. He loses his self-esteem. You know, there's a lot of discussions in our society today about security, and Americans care about security. A lot of the discussion is a false sense of security, but it's just about security. But the United States is not the land of security. People didn't get on a boat and come to Jamestown to be secure. The United States is a land of opportunity. Opportunity to be great, opportunity to fail and try again, but most importantly, the opportunity of that bricklayer to live life on his own terms, to pursue his personal happiness given his beliefs, given his values, to pursue his happiness as a free and independent man. That's why people came to America. That is the American sense of life, and that is what made the United States so great, and that is what's so precious to protect. Thank you very much. had a series of misinvestments over time. The biggest ones have always been caused by government policy and usually by the Federal Reserve. But we also have a number of big mistakes in terms of general economic policy. The minimum wage is one of the most destructive ones for young people and for uh, minorities in particular. Because if you look at how people progress, they have to get into the workforce and learn a skill set. So if we have schools and inner city schools that don't teach people how to do anything, and we set a price for their people's labor that's above what a small business can afford to hire them for. If somebody's only worth $5 an hour in what they produce and you have to pay them $7, you can't hire them because you'll go broke doing that. And, and it creates a lot of unemployment and keeps people from getting in the workforce and getting the skills that allow them to, uh, to do better in the long term. 
regulations uh, are very destructive uh, in terms of proper allocation of resources and innovation and creativity. So there are some underlying structural issues uh, that uh, underlie our co economy that reduce productivity even in the good times and don't keep us from being as efficient as we should be in the good times. Mr. Allison, I uh, fully appreciate the role of the uh, deposit insurance and, and the, the, the puzzle that you, you uh, put forth there, um, and, and the, the disincentive effects of, of welfare and all that kind of thing. But do you think that there should be no such thing as a, a social safety net in, in the modern uh, market economy? What, what I, uh, well, I don't know specifically talk about deposit insurance. I think deposit insurance has really been destructive in the allocation of resources. Uh, it would be very easy to develop a private insurance pool for deposit insurance in the sense that um, deposit uh, institutions could, could, could do cross guarantees of each other, which is really what goes on in the insurance business, it goes on in the brokerage business, and we had much lower failure rates. And the main reason is if you have some skin in the game, you're going to be much more disciplined. And, and I think that uh, that's what we lacked from the FDIC because in the good times they don't regulate the institutions because of the political, the banks have good political contacts and in the bad times they overreact. In terms of social safety net, I'm a libertarian and what I believe is there's a very important role for government. But the bank, the real purpose of government is to protect individual rights. That's why the government was created to keep me from taking what you've earned, either by force or by fraud. So what should government do? It should do three big things. One, we have to have a national defense to keep us from getting hurt by the bad guys overseas. We need policemen to keep us hurt by bad guys in the U.S. And we need an effective court system to, where we have legitimate disputes so we don't have to take guns at each other. After that, I don't think there's any role for government. I do think there's a very important role for charity. As I mentioned, I think there's a very important role for charity. But when people become entitled to things, what happens to them is they become dependent and they give up the pursuit of personal happiness and I think that's incredibly da uh, damaging. So charity is, you're not entitled to charity. I think there's a very important role for charity but you have to, you know, there has to be a reason that someone chooses to help you. When you become entitled, the real victims aren't the people that pay the taxes like me. The real victims are the people that lose the sense of personal responsibility. Because if you're not responsible for yourself, you can't be happy, right? If you're dependent, you're giving up the pursuit of your personal happiness. And I think that's bad for those individuals, and I think it's bad for society in general. I think it has really negative consequences. So that's my view of the role of government. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Uh, Yes, sir, Bill Maloney, I couldn't uh, sit here and ask a question. I just ran for governor twice. Oh. Started a business here in West Virginia when I was 25, and uh, I've been chilly on my rescue. Did a lot of things in my life that I just want to help others with. And after uh, seeing $4.5 million spent telling everybody how bad a guy I was, <laughs> how would you convince anybody to run for public office? Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a huge problem. I, I, I have personally been approached a number of times about running for public office and have chosen not to do it. And, and the reason is it's very hard to get an integrated message across. And the other thing is a lot of people sell a free lunch and a lot of people want a free lunch. They may not realize that the free lunch is bad for them in the long term. They, they think in very short term uh, terms. And it's very difficult if you believe in limited government to get elected in many places because somebody else is promising a free lunch and it's hard for you to run against that first, that free lunch. So, Myself, um, I think a lot of the fight is here in universities. It's ideas that matter. I think politicians reflect the ideas in our society. So we get what we deserve, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, um, I think it's ideas, and I think the ideas that underlie America are really under attack in our society. They've been attacked in our public school systems. They've been attacked in our universities. And that's what you, re you re see reflected in the voters. And, and those principles really made our country great. They're not, you know, they're not malleable ideas. They're really important, profound ideas. So I don't advise people to run, even though I hope they will run. <laughs> I hope the good ones will run.
you see examples in the United States of the woman who sued McDonald's and got a settlement of like $10 million for taking a coffee and spilling it on herself, knowing that it's a coffee, it's going to be hot. So in your opinion, do you think the U.S.'s court, current court system destroys personal responsibility and makes people more entitled to things such as that? I mean, you see response, or examples of that in big pharma and everything else. So how do you feel about the court system here? Yeah, I think the unfortunate thing is that instead of developing our court system the way we should, you, you, the, the Constitution itself is actually a reflection of English common law. It's in, and, and a lot added on to it, but, it, but it's a reflection of English common law. And if, if, if we hadn't introduced such a huge regulatory state, I believe our court system would be radically better than it is today. And it is tragic that the system can be gamed. If you go to the McDonald's example, uh, they've improved some of that because what was going on, of course, people were shopping. There were certain places where plaintiffs knew they would win, <laughs> where the judges had actually been basically bought by giving them enough money to get elected, and, and they knew what the outcome was going to be. Uh, and basically, not, you hear the actual cases, most of the worst things were usually settlements that never got to court because businesses were afraid of that. There's been a pretty big effort to try to bring that back under control. What I believe in regards to those kind of situations, people, if, if you back, I don't think the coffee example was somebody, I think that was the, the person that spilled the coffee's fault, right? But even, you can be harmed by another person, and I think you should receive very liberal damage claims for that. But, but punitive damages make no sense. Why should I get a huge windfall as a, pu a punishment to somebody else and, and most of the money go to the attorneys? If, if somebody wants to punish them, the government ought to fine them, the taxpayers ought to get the money. It shouldn't be a windfall to me um, beyond the real damages that are done to me. I think if you got rid of punitive damages, you'd get rid of most of the abuse of the system, which is what motivates so many attorneys to you know, chase ambulances because they, they get, get a huge economic windfall. Uh, and, and that's an unhealthy system. Freddie and Fannie actually uh, were buying 46% of the housing market at the peak of the crisis, and um, uh, they were setting the rules because anybody with that big a share is, is a dominant player uh, in the marketplace. Uh, and secondly, I mean, private institutions were incented through this Community Reinvestment Act to get into the subprime lending business. If you didn't make enough subprime loans, then you couldn't open a branch, you couldn't expand your institutions. And then a number of people on Wall Street made some very serious mistakes. At the, the, the dilemma to me is not that they made the mistakes, it's that they didn't get the consequences. <laughs> I would have let Citigroup fail. I don't agree with the contagion argument. I think we'd be a lot better off now if markets had been allowed to clear. We'd have gone deeper and we'd been a lot better off if Citigroup and et al. had been around to, uh, to fail. If you look at those instruments, though, the thing that's interesting to understand, if you get into the derivatives market, uh, first, the derivatives market didn't fail. A lot of things they call derivatives are not derivatives. <laughs> They're just bonds that were high-risk bonds backed by high-risk mortgages. Those bonds were largely bought by very sophisticated investors like the Harvard Endowment, who over the years had made huge returns gambling on high-risk instruments. They finally got called. Their losses were largely deserved. <laughs> That's the way markets work. They were gambling. Now, that, there were a few people that that wasn't true for, but most of the losses on the high-risk stuff sold in the private market were hedge funds, Harvard Endowment, people like that who had, who had been playing, getting great returns, taking great risks. It wasn't that they didn't know what they were buying. They just thought they'd get out before the party was over, and they, were, they did. They did. So, and you've, you've seen there's been very little actual cases of fraud prosecutions because it was very little fraud. <laughs> it was people gambling. They should have taken the losses, and we'd all be better off if we let them, let them take their losses. 
But uh, sure, private institutions made mistakes, and they should have been allowed to fail. Hi, I just had a question about uh, the minimum wage. Um, in the last State of the Union address, uh, the President spoke about tying the minimum wage to inflation rates. And I was wondering, do you think that's a more positive step in the right direction or actually even a worse policy? I think it's a worse policy. I think minimum wage is a bad thing because I think all it does is create unemployment. Now, either it, either it creates unemployment or it doesn't matter. The law of supply and demand is an economic law. It's not negotiable by politicians. If you set the price above the clearing price, the market doesn't clear. If you went to the grocery store tomorrow and, and milk was $300 a gallon, you probably wouldn't buy milk, right? <laughs> it would be wasted. The same thing is true for wages. If you set the price above what somebody's able to produce, somebody doesn't get a job. And, and, we're, and BB and T were largely a, were largely a small business bank. And if you if you're running a small business, that's real. You can't pay somebody, you know, nine dollars an hour at plus fringes plus et cetera. It turns into about eleven dollars an hour if they only are worth six dollars an hour, because you'll go broke. So you can't wish away the laws of economics. Now the reason that those many cases young people aren't worth more is because our education system has failed. So I think the ultimate solution for this problem, I personally believe, is a privatization of education. And I think we ought to be supporting students through vouchers and tax credits and create competition in the education market. You know, in businesses, we talk about being innovative and creative. Actually, we hate to be innovative and creative. We force to be innovative and creative or we go out of business. Schools, when they do bad things, what happens? They get more money. <laughs> it's a, kind of an inverse incentive program. What if we had Bill Gates and Sam Waltons and, and Steve Jobs in the education field? There would be hundreds of thousands of experiments. Some wouldn't work, but there'd be a few tremendous breakthroughs. Markets are experiments, most of which are failing. For every Google, there's a thousand or two thousand failed Googles. It, but all the failed experiments are part of the learning. If you keep the failures from happening, yeah, if you keep the schools from failing, you can't learn. And, and, and that's why we need, I believe, privatization of, of schools and subsidized students, if you subsidize uh, parents and let them make those choices and, you would, and you'd have a, a many experiments and then those students would be worth more than the minimum wage. That's the real problem. Hello? Yeah. Let me add just one comment to that, uh, quite a very good question. And uh, I lived through indexation in Brazil. And in the late uh, 70s, Brazil was experienced about 50% of inflation per year. They decided to go and index everything. They index wages, salaries, interest. By, by 1986, we were experiencing, and I was managing a company, 50% per month, 5,000 to 6,000% per year. Indexation of any kind, particularly to quote unquote CPIs of any kind. By the way, our CPI is so low because we don't normally include uh, gasoline and a few other things. It's a nightmare. It, it feeds inflation over time. So uh, I can tell you, I may disagree or not with uh, the minimum wage, but I certainly disagree with indexation of any kind. Not good. In the examples in the Weimar Republic, uh, uh, with, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Germany, Brazil, Latin America, some countries in Asia, Clear indexation doesn't work. It seems to be a great, you know, and, and very respective and responsive uh, artifice, but it's just not very constructive. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. We had a question of this gentleman here, and then I come back to you. Yes. You mentioned the minarchic role of government to police courts, national defense, and I was wondering because. When the United States was founded, we were essentially a minarchy. We had a very limited role of government, and, but we've expanded and expanded upon that into the point where we have the Leviathan today with a military industrial complex where all around the world we have massive regulations. So my question to you is, what if you establish this minarchy, what is to prevent the experiment from turning out the exact way it has today? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> the the uh, founding fathers tried really hard. Uh, if you actually, 
I don't know how, it's interesting how few people have actually studied the, if you study the Constitution, it's really clear what the limits of the federal government are. There's 14 things they're entitled to do. That's it. It, 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 it says what they can do, which include, doesn't include 90% of what we do. <clears throat> and it does provide for amendments, but we've never amended to do those things, that, <laughs> the things that we're doing. Uh, so um, what else could they have done? People argue that Congress doesn't work efficiently. I think that's intentional. They, the Founding Fathers didn't want the government to work very well. They wanted it to be inefficient because they didn't want it to do a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so I thought they did, I think they did amazingly well. I think the one thing that they missed, this was actually their intent because their intent in the Commerce Clause was that all that was doing was, was keeping states from putting penalties on others. That's what they meant. But they should have been very explicit just like they defined uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. They should have had freedom of commerce and sp explicit, explicitly said the government couldn't be in the, in the giving away a, a, a money business because crony capitalism is a huge factor and a lot of people mistake markets for crony capitalism and they don't like market economies, they're thinking of crony capitalism and, and that's a really bad thing and, and crony capitalism incents a lot of very bad behavior. Uh, and in a true free market with limited government, that, the government wouldn't be able to give away uh, bonuses like that. So I think that's the one big thing they missed. Uh, obviously, uh, things like slavery and th crazy things like that they missed. But I mean, in terms of, of, what, of what's mo uh, today uh, important today. There's one. Now, my last question here is kind of an oxymoron being asked here at WVU, but do you think universities have become too tied in with uh, the pursuit of happiness because everyone's been told that you need to go to college to get a good job to be successful, or as you put it, to become, to have self-esteem uh, with your accomplishments. But do you think trade schools should be pushed more in high school and even lower, and maybe even in college so that we might even be able to get manufacturing jobs back and get a skilled labor force to promote new types of innovation not in a corporate uh, yeah. setting. Yes, and I think it's the opposite of the pursuit of happiness. What I think is people are born with natural talents. And uh, we develop those talents or we, or we don't develop those talents. Not everyone has a set of talents that lead to a university education. That's just a myth. I use the analogy from my own personal perspective. I love music, but I have zero musical talent. If the goal in the world was for me to be a great musician, I'd be a very unhappy person. <laughs> we impose that goal on many people that don't have a natural academic ability, but have other talents that could be great electricians or great medical technicians or great computer programmers or great lots of other stuff. And that is really reduces happiness because when people pursue what their passion is, which is usually what you're good at, they're much more likely to be happy. And happiness, as I said, there's nothing wrong with money, but it's not the pursuit of money and the pursuit of happiness are very different goals. So I think our education system encourages and society encourages many people to go to colleges that would be a lot happier, more productive, and we'd have a better society if they did what their natural talents were. And, and, and I think that's, a, and of course we got a real economic disaster coming. We got a really big, uh, the next big bubble is going to be in education where so many students have taken on a bunch of debt, then they can't get a job, and if they're in the bottom half of a second quartile university now, they're likely to get a job that they could have gotten without ever going to school in the first place. Uh, that's not good. And, and education debt exceeds car loans today, so that's a pretty big problem. We got another disaster, so it's a double disaster. But mostly, we're keeping people from being more productive and happier and doing what their natural talents are. Hi, um, I'm a member of Students for Liberty here on campus. Good for and you. I was just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to better connect with the message of well, that's a great question. I think um, trying to help people connect it to their personal lives and how precious their freedoms are to them uh, and, and concretize it in, in that regard. Um, 
understanding the ideas that underlie free society yourself so you can communicate them. When people bring up issues that seem to be the politically correct issue of the day, have thought about it and, and be able to say, well, that sounds good. Minimum wage sounds good, but here's the consequences. Some people won't have jobs. And, you know, it, be, be, be able to understand and explain the consequences. Because most of the time, my observation, no matter what political persuasion, most people come from good intentions. That's not always true, but most people come from good intentions. They just have a misinterpretation of the real implications of the ideas they hold and what their consequences are. So I would study myself. I would be able to communicate, try to communicate my ideas. Uh, you can't change somebody's mind. You can plant seeds that allow them to change their own mind. Uh, and, uh, and just actually have a good time doing it because people like to come where people are having a good time. Pursuing happiness and freedom and liberty are good things, right? That's fun. I think the real consequences of single-payer health care would be a radical reduction in the quality of health care. Uh, if you look at Europe, two things. One, they don't innovate. And two, once you're 80 years old, good luck. And now that's an interesting, you can argue that, but that's an, I don't think that's the government should make those kind of choices. In terms of entrepreneurship, I think they'd hurt entrepreneurship in the whole medical field, which there's a tremendous opportunity where the United States does about 90% of the world's entrepreneurship <laughs> in medical care because we have a freer medical system. Uh, and, and we also turn it into reality. Uh, and, it's, and, and so I think that when you, if, you go, if you start controlling the system through a single payer, you're not actually, they don't want innovation because innovation creates costs, right? I mean, they say they want innovation, but, but most of the new technologies increase costs. So if your job is to control costs, you actually become an anti-innovator. That's what's happened in Europe, happened in, in Canada. So I think a single-payer system would really be bad for entrepreneurship, and certainly bad for entrepreneurship in anything related to medical care, which is a huge, huge feat. And this is going to be <laughs> Another last question. Do you feel that the government should have played a role in the past decades or centuries in terms of correcting uh, perhaps racial-based or gender-based uh, biases, uh, particularly with respect to education or, let's say, women's access to jobs? Well, let's take the Civil Rights Act. I actually think that that was a very appropriate law because people had been abused, their rights had been abused. Uh, even, I, even though in general I wouldn't say that uh, government can tell businesses who they can hire and that kind of stuff. In that special case, I think they, it, it should have passed. But I do think those kind of laws ought to phase out after a period of time. I think, yes, you, you correct the, the wrong and then you don't double the wrong. You, so it's 10 years, 15 years, whatever it is, then that kind of law goes away. But I, th I think if you actually look at particularly what happened in race, the real driver was the school system. I mean, and that's a public, it was the public schools, and the reason that a lot of minorities couldn't get jobs, they didn't know anything, because they didn't get an education. So that, so they were really, the government, and of course in the South, visited a terrible thing from a racial perspective. And so I think, yes, there are times when the government does, have, when there's been so much abuse, it does have to act, but I think the law should go away because th then it invites, it become, now it becomes a racial quota and that's very bad for everybody. And so that's the problem, not that we passed the law, but that we kept it past its, its good, whatever good it was doing. Hello, yeah, let me address the question that was asked about uh, healthcare. And uh, I spent uh, 30 years of my life on healthcare uh, all, all around the world. And uh, no developed country has universal coverage available without price controls. Canada is price controlled, Western Europe is price controlled, South Korea is price controlled, parts of China are price controlled, Australia is price controlled, New Zealand is price controlled, Singapore is price controlled. That means the following. You cannot launch an innovation unless you get an accepted price set by the government, good or not. Second, many times you have a situation where 
the government is running out of budgets, uh, of money in their budgets, they cut across significantly. For example, Germany, even though they have price controls for medicines, for diagnostics, for physicians, for hospitals, every couple of years they do a haircut, 10% across the board to everybody, sometimes 20%. Recently in China, they had an 18% price cut across the board. When you look in terms of innovation in the pharmaceutical industry, we, is, we are the only country who we have been protecting patents for 200 years with free prices. We're the only country today, we innovate twice or three times more than any other country in the world. In fact, we produce more innovation in this country than the whole European community together. So I don't know what's cause uh, or consequence here, but I can tell you, there's no free lunch, as uh, uh, Mr. Ellis was saying before. And so unfortunately, as we created this new uh, system of healthcare in the US, no one was willing because you know we're in the situation now that people are not willing to pay attention to information. No one did an analysis of what happens to Canada or to the UK or to Germany or to Australia or to Japan in terms of availability of new medicines, availability of decent jobs. Uh, if you work for the government in Canada as a physician, you'll be making $120,000 a year, and thank you very much. And a lot of physicians from Canada will come to this country where they can make as much their capacity and their uh, capability and abilities allow them to. So I think uh, it's an interesting one because we, we now have this gigantic system in place, $3 trillion, uh, you know, a significant part of the economy, but we didn't pay attention. We do not want to learn from any one other experience, which is unfortunate. I just want to make that point because I think this one area, we're going to start, we're just bringing in, in fact, a health economist in the next uh, six months. And this is one area that we're very interested in, as, as well as allergy, healthcare, hospitality, et cetera. But healthcare is a very important uh, issue for us. It's a great opportunity, but you have to be thinking, are we going to do it freely, or are we going to do it with lots of regulation, including price control? And when you look at a P&L of a company, at the very top, revenues are made up of two things. Quantity, volume, times, price. Very critical. So we're going to stop here now, and I'm going to thank Mr. Allison very much. <laughs> and we're going to give him a memento of his visit, which is the Mountaineer. All right. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he is making himself available for autographing.